All right, dude, we are here. Monty, one half of Client Liaison. Uh, dude, so good to hang out with you. Thanks for having me. Um, I was just chatting to you saying I've definitely had some of the best times of my life to your music, which is um, some very uh, big, fun experiences. One of them actually with uh, none other than uh, Daryl Braithwaite. Ah, uh, yeah. I, I was in attendance. Uh, was New Year's New, Eve? New, I think it was a New Year's Eve one. Yeah. That was a very pleasant surprise. Yeah, so yeah, that was... Yeah, we just we always wanted to one up ourselves and try and bring the big guests on stage. So he came out and we we did horses with him. That was pretty special. Unbelievable. I think I was on someone's shoulders who was a close friend and it was a very sweaty affair, but definitely worth it. Yeah. Um, mate, well, first of all, thanks so much for just creating the time to be here. I know, particularly for a lot of musicians now, it's been such a full on past couple of years that um you know hasn't necessarily been recognized by those in certain levels of power what the creative industry has been through but we're also at really exciting times where things the lights are starting to turn back on the music starting to be played um and today i will get to kind of the the musician the creative the performer side but also like a really good chance to just meet you Mm -hmm. um so in however long you would like to share um we'd love for our listeners, some of them would be very familiar with you, but some of them, you know, this might be the first time encountering um, you and, and um, the music of Client Liaison. Um, love to just hear a little bit, bit about who you are. I tell myself I'm a dancer first and a uh, probably a performer second and a singer third, a producer and fashion designer. Um, I love performance and dance and music. And uh, it's coming on 10 years that Client Liaison has been releasing music, which is myself and Harvey Miller, who um, I met through an old friend of mine. He's my old friend Geordie's brother. And Geordie now plays in our band. So, yeah, we started 10 years ago. We released a song called End of the Earth on YouTube and got a little bit of a buzz and we started playing shows around Melbourne. And then we just slowly kept pushing and releasing music and trying to um, market our music in different ways um, and performing eventually around the world. And, um, yeah, that's what we still do today. So, yeah. You've made it out 10 years. That feels like you're, you're kind of seasoned now. Do you feel 10 years? Is that a milestone for you guys? Yeah, I think it is. I mean, especially after COVID, you know. Mm. I think we're in, like, we're in the, like, third or fourth chapter of our career, uh, which is quite nice. We always said that we straddled the pop, the underground world and the pop world because we've got quite a poppy sound. But we've like we always put a real emphasis on having like a greater meaning in our lyrics, um, making people think twice, giving like a whole another visual representation, a multi sensory experience to our shows and videos. I want to go back to what you said around being a dancer, mm-hmm. and that was the first word that you identified yeah. in. In Australian masculine culture, how have you navigated someone who has, you know, you, you identify as a dancer? Has that been something you've had to move through? Yeah, I mean, yeah, things have changed. Uh, when I was growing up, it was a little bit different. It's not that long ago, but um, I, I've always enjoyed dressing up. Um, I love Prince. He's my hero. I used to um, listen to Prince so fervently and, and follow him around. Eventually, he brought me up on stage a few times, wow. which is awesome. But I would dress pretty crazy and I'd go into the countryside and people would heckle at me. I've always enjoyed dressing differently and like pushing boundaries of performance and music and that kind of thing. And um, I found Australia quite close-minded, especially in the countryside. And our first song, End of the Earth, is about Australia and it's actually a criticism of Australia and the tall poppy syndrome and bringing people down. We ended up making a music video that celebrated Australia. So it had like a, a two, two layers to it, which is actually quite nice. Because then once we actually started performing and people started cheering, um, you know, the, the, the script flipped, flipped in my head, you know. It's like glass is half full. Like this country is amazing and actually it celebrates difference and um, celebrates creativity. Um, you've just got to really put it out there and 
make your stand. If I think about my teenage years, like I remember in year nine um, for a certain art assignment, I topped the grade and my mate goes, that's a bit gay. And I was like, well, I'll never do art again. Yeah, And, and right. so a big journey for me. And also I was totally in that culture too. That was just the slang that was mm-hmm. used and, yeah. you know, um, absolutely take my responsibility for that. But then at the same time, a big journey I've gone on now is how do I reclaim back my creativity? Mm-hmm. And so I... Um, a couple of years ago, I, I was like, what is something that I would do that is so off brand for me? Mm-hmm. Like, and I was like sitting on the couch, I was like, stand up comedy course at NIDA. Wow. And I remember signing up to the course, rocking up there and I was sitting there in this small circle in this like very dingy, dingy room. And um, everyone's like, so let's check in while you're here. Uh, why are you here? And um, everyone's like, oh, people say I'm funny. I've always wanted to be a comedian. And I was like, I'm just shitting myself. Mm-hmm. Everything in my identity says don't be here. And that's why I'm just doing this. And awesome. it was just, it, it like it cracked something open in me. Yeah. And that was, you know, I've shared that story with a couple of times with a few different people. But for me, it was just an opening into this part of myself that I just shut off. Mm-hmm. And if I look at like particularly your journey, it seems like you lent into that really young. Was that because of family environments? Was it because of inspiration you got from Prince? Or what was the little creative fire? Yeah, I mean, um, when I was growing up, I'd always like, if I was with my friends, um, you know, the parents would have dinner and I'd be like, let's put together a play, let's put together a performance. Or we'd film videos, like action videos with little video ha- handy cams, that kind of thing. Um, I don't know, creativity, creative things just get me excited. Um, I, you know, in terms of that journey of like, I kind of hated Australia coming out of school. Um, I, I actually went to school with a lot of country kids and I love them a lot. But there was like a, I went to boarding school and there was a distinction, there was distinctions in your identity between um, a third of the school was from Asia, then a big proportion was from the country and then there was the city kids and, the, and then there was the local kids and there was these kind of divides mm. and there were so many wonderful people and of course people were friends with everyone but I, I found that very frustrating and I really came alive when I travelled overseas and um, I really connected with India because it had different subsets of cultures, but people were so proud of their identity and proud that their identity was part of many mm. other identities. And, um, yeah, just such a colourful culture, mm. you know, celebrating the, the diversity of the culture. And um, in Australia, I felt like people were scared and they would, yeah. like, some people would, like, pretend to be the country kid or, yeah. you know, pretend to be part of the Asian group. And um, I didn't like that. Um, but you know, it's double edged sword. Like, I feel like I was a bully at school, you know, I was a bully, but then I would help kids that would be bullied. Um, but there's something powerful about breaking people's, um, expectation and through performance and dressing and creativity. And when you see someone perform at first, you feel discomfort for them. And you go, oh, no, please, please mm. don't, don't be embarrassed. Don't be embarrassed. But when you see them have confidence, it brings confidence out of you. Yeah. And suddenly there's a connection and that like seeing that relationship between audience and performer, I just love that. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's almost, from my experience, the permission gets given to be like, oh, I've yes. got that unlocked yeah. in me. Yeah. Yeah. And I had very similar high school experience. As you were saying that, I was like, wow, like that's literally how our school was set up mm-hmm. as well. And then the policing that went on in school of like, right. you know, you can do that, you can't do that. I'm going to bully you so that the, I... The hierarchy. The social like, hierarchy yeah. was massive. And it was like, you know, you you have to establish what role you play in that hierarchy. Yeah. And sometimes it's like to, to bully or other times you do get bullied because that's how it goes around. Yeah. Yeah, and I think I often think back for the, you know, the creative kids. Like that's where that creativity in Australia, I think there is so much brilliance, but then also to your point, the tall poppy syndrome Mm. really like cuts people down. And that's effectively what the analogy is for people who aren't familiar with it. It's basically if there's a tall poppy in the field, you cut it down. So it's the same height as everyone. And there's actually a really interesting book called the Australian leadership paradox, Mm -hmm. what it takes to lead in the lucky country. And they talk about us having a really high dependence on authority, but a low trust. We really um, love the underdog story. Um, and we love the larrikin nature and tall poppy syndrome as these like four key pillars 
And one of the theories for like modern white Australia is that's because we were in we're convicts yep. established for this you know part two of Australia's colonial history um, established as con- convicts. So if you're doing better than anyone else as a convict, you cut them down. You love the larrikin because they bring up morale in the jail cell. Um, you're all underdogs. And and so it's a very interesting psychology that's there. I remember I attended a, a conference in the US once and um, I remember walking in and being like, so people be like, oh, cool, what's your name? What do you do? And I was like, oh, my name's Hunter. This is what I do. And I just watched them like die. And then I was like, what do you do? And they're like, I do this, 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 this. And yes. they really sold themselves. I was like, wow. Next person I met, I tried it on. And it was a very different experience, mm. particularly in the States. Like they really lit up. Yeah. Have you found that for, for like the expression um, that's almost allowed or the permission to be more expressive as you've toured across the world? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, you just, the clubs in Europe, the, yeah, the freedom. Yeah. Um, I think you've hit a really good point though. Like there's, I think f- there's a conflict between tall pos- poppy syndrome and it creative expression in mm. Australia. Um so yeah, that, that that and that was a conflict for me. So yeah, because you, you're kind of vulnerable when you're coming out of school as well. Yeah. So now I don't I don't think about it. You know, I don't care. And and I think Australia is a more creative, diverse place as well. It's great. Yeah. So like you know, and it's continually trying to celebrate more more and more diversity. So you know, yeah, it's it's not something I think about as much anymore. Yeah. Yeah. But it's interesting even hearing how you have talked when you're coming out of school, even how you reflect back on the schools social status and the hierarchies and the, the sex of high school but then you know the first music that you produced as well was like mm-hmm. a social commentary right so has that level of like social awareness always been there for you where you can kind of step back a bit and see how things are organized oh i mean i'm probably i'm probably fearful of being too truthful in my work and mm. um yeah i i because i love theater and i love that element of performance of whoa what is real and what is not that often the songs that i've uh, written are in bubbles so but i would like to do that more like comment on yeah society and and the the world and where it's going yeah, I think you guys do that really well. Well, even if it's like the taste tester now, yeah. like you know the satire that is then turned up, right? Yeah, like you know the limousines mm-hmm. and then John Howard. Like, well, yeah, like the limousines an interesting one because it's like, oh, we're gonna we're gonna write a song about a limousine. It's like, oh, fancy limousine, but like limousine's kind of a funny <laughs> yeah. luxury item, you know? Yeah. It's like a novelty item, you know? Yeah. And we we bought an eighties uh, vintage eighties limousine, and so it's good. like luxury a limousine <laughs> like everyone can get around that it's like yeah what's the process for coming up with those like iconic australia even like just to give, could you just give us a bit of a background you know you talk about being board members you know like your merch as well like mm-hmm. there's so much thoughtfulness around the satire could yeah you just bring that to life a bit oh, it's 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 we get asked about it a lot and it, it seems so it's like the process is quite automatic we're just trying to find things that connect um that add new meaning to the music or even within the music. So it's hard to talk about and you get yourself in some pickles when you start talking to people that are, you know, they're well-versed in university literature and you're like, (laughs) you know, Australian identity and that kind of thing. And it's like, oh God, why are we even playing in this space? But Mm. it it comes from a place of fun really. It's like having fun and connecting to people. That's the, that's the main thing. And, like we will go to any length possible to to have an outcome that we're satisfied with and we we there's two of us and we both have to agree on things so sometimes it takes a long time yeah but um and we we love collaborating for that reason because it you know throws the the ball around especially with music videos and things like that but yeah we just keep going until something kind of sticks and yeah. it can be something very absurd yeah. you know that in the end is is the best and just feels right. Feels right. Yeah. And then connects to the audience. Yeah. That's part of the creative process. It's like, we're here now? How do we? Okay, great. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's it. Um, yeah, it's like, oh, let's give champagne, uh, let's give oysters <laughs> out during our DJ set. You know, like, that's great. Or like, what about I change my shirt during the DJ set and iron a shirt on stage? You know, because I want a fresh, fresh shirt because I've been dancing too hard. You know, it's like, 
Cool. It's so good because it is purely brilliant and creative, but also it becomes like the talking point or one of the talking points from the performance right. too. Yeah, because yeah. people people listen with their eyes first. Yeah. You know, yeah. they see, they get, you know, they get pulled in by their eyes. And so when we were starting out, you'd be on this shitty little stage and we'd bring our own smoke machine. Yeah. And we'd go straight to the lighting console. Like, forget the sound check. We need the lights to be right. Like, oh, can we turn the house lights on and then off when people arrive so it jolts them or something? Yeah. You know, like any way to stand out. Oh, know? so good. But it's like, I feel like sometimes people take that for granted. Like, the mm. first of all, the grind. It's what yeah. do they say? Like, the long road to overnight success mm -hmm. is, you know, they just see the big performance now, but it's like, literally, go back in time. You're doing the admin and the ops and the logistics required. Oh, yeah. We were, we were on the catering. You know, we would do everything. We've done everything, which is really fun. It's, like, really nice to be hands-on, but also use you know, big crews or go to big studios, but also just do everything yourself. It's like really empowering. It's great. Um, yeah. It's just like in the end, it's about having fun for us. So something that gets us excited. Yeah. yeah. And, and as someone who's been in the audience multiple times, I can feel it, you know, and oh, like cool. even now how much you light up talking about the creative brilliance in it is just, it's really special. Yeah, when we were starting out, people would just hide behind their instruments, especially in Australia. Like yeah. you go to the States and the bands are like, whoa, they're yeah. like crazy outfits and like really performing. And it's like, Jesus. But here it was like, no one's doing anything. They're just hiding behind their instruments. You know, it's like, oh, it's cool. And everyone's like, yeah, it's cool. It's like, yeah, but you're not engaging. You're not connecting, mm, you know, yeah. you're not making people think. Yeah. Oh, there you go. There's often you hear so much about feeling in music, but then mm -hmm. also making people think, I think, is mm. a very interesting point as well. In all your kind of performances, are there any kind of standout, I know it's a hard question, but moments or, or performances where things have just like almost been like a spiritual experience where you've just gone, yeah. hoofed. Yeah, I mean, you, that transcendental feeling is, mm. it's often there. It's nice when you feel, you know, you have the audience in the palm of your hand. Yeah. That connection. And it's even better when they, you don't have them at the start. They're unsure. Yeah. And then you say, oh, you see their faces like, like oh, and they light up and then they just start dancing and let go of themselves. But um, I would often, I just say the biggest, yeah. you know, because it's, it's, it's such a rush. You always want it to be bigger and yeah. connect with more people and get a bigger rush yourself. Yeah. It's a drug of a kind. So, I mean, Splendor in the Grass with Tina Arena a few mm. years ago, that was pretty magical. Most shows, they kind of start with a high, and then they go up and they have to come down. Yeah. You know, people just have to have a breather. Yeah. Our down point was Tina Arena coming on stage. <laughs> yeah. And so it just never went, it never came down. Yeah. It just kept going up. Wow. How do you, because in the human experience, if we go up, to your point, you have to go down. Mm. How is that, how have you navigated that? Even as someone being a performer, like... I can't believe I'm about to reference this, but I also can believe it. I remember watching the Lady Gaga documentary mm. on um, Netflix yep. and um, she talks about going, being on stage, 100,000 people screaming out to her, her name to mm -hmm. then going back to a hotel room and she's by herself. Yeah, yeah. Have you had a, to navigate anything like that with these big peak experiences that then you drop back down into kind of yourself? Of course, yeah. Yeah, this, um, it messes with your sleep, your psyche your ego, you know, family life, mm. you know, because it's an absurd proposition that all these people are like, oh, you're amazing. Yeah. It's like, what? This is some character I've created, yeah. you know, this is not me. So, um, and also music is so tied up with, up with momentum, yeah. you know. If a band has momentum, then great doors start opening. So yeah. you just start creating more momentum. Oh, yeah. make it bigger, you know. Yeah. Oh, it's like. It's a consumerism of a sort. Yeah. You know, we'll consume more and then we'll get bigger and then, you know, and COVID's a really been a really good, like, mm. wow. You know, we've had some troubles and COVID hit and then it's like, wow, it's a wake up call. So you come and we come and do it now and like after a while it's like, oh, you know what's good for you. you yeah. Know? And you can have a, a dabble of ego and a, double of party and yeah, you know yeah. and still do the like you can still be naughty yeah. you know like yeah. in, in in inverted commas you yeah can, you know still let loose and have fun but um yeah you got it's it is hard to stay grounded yeah absolutely I, I get caught up in like why did because i take the work so seriously like 
I just think of our last show last weekend, our, our sax player put his flute on the table where I get, I do a costume change. I was like, don't put your flute there. And he's like, I was doing it because of the, I was like, don't put your flute there. And it was like, there's so much tension. Mm. It's so like, there's so, it's palpable, you yeah. know? And then you finish and you're like, yeah, and you hug and it's awesome. Um, but yeah, there's, there's, I mean, trying to, a lot of the time you're just trying to deal with the chatter of your mind, which oh. we're all trying to do, you know? Yeah, yeah, but I think also to your point there, like it is absolutely like a, a peak experience moment where your senses are so alive and alert and the adrenaline is flowing. And in that moment, particularly when you're performing, like your every minute feeling you're in almost alimen and like flow with. And so having the flute there is fucking annoying. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, just don't do that. Well, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so that's an interesting kind of point is amongst like having to be on and in front of so many people, no doubt there are conflicts inside of the team and, mm -hmm. or the, the band and, and the crew around it. How do you navigate conflicts when it's all about like being on and looking all happy, but then you got to run an operation in the background? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's um it's hard because I would say don't take yourself too seriously, but I do that. I can't help <laughs> it. So, um, you know, communication. It just you just periodically when things when it's hard to communicate, that's when you need to the most. Yeah. You know, when you feel that there's tension and you don't want to talk about it, that's when you do, and it just builds up, and eventually you will. Yes. <laughs> you know. Yeah. It gets there. And event and it it always helps. It always, yeah, always helps, you know. I think I'm sure, that, you know, there there is times when it, it just, things are, you know, that you can't reconcile things, but. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's the hardest thing, right? When you got so much going on, you just feel like a kettle that's about to boil mm. and the steam goes off. It's like, oh, that's when I got to communicate the most. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, for me, a big, a, a really big uh, helpful thing that I've done in the last few years is start a gratitude journal. Nice. And just I got one off the internet. It's like has a quote at the top. It's called by Intelligent Change. They have these different journals. A little quote at the top, three things that you're grateful for. Mm. And I try to do like, oh, lovely warm ginger tea. Then I say, oh, this beautiful house I'm in. And mm. then our, um, our audience that come to our shows nice. and cheer. That's amazing. And then it's three things you'd like to do today. And then a daily affirmation. I am a singer, a uh, writer, because I don't, I don't believe I'm a singer. You know, mm. I'm like, I'm not really a singer. I'm not really a musician. Yeah. This happens to all of us. And then at the end of the day, there's a little section that says three things um, that were great that happened today. And that just, it really helped me shift my mind. I, um, I take things so seriously. Mm. And um, yeah, just like that, you, just seeing the, the things that aren't right, you know, being a perfectionist. Yeah. You you're, you're, you're have turmoil from that mindset. So just opening it up and having some gratitude and, and trying to give more in your mindset. So good. They, the gratitude itself from a psychological point of view actually does start to rewire the chemicals in your brain mm -hmm. because you slow down, you become more present and you think about the opportunities that are in front of you yeah. opposed to just the autopilot, everything's getting faster and quicker and I need yeah. more or the consumerism culture. But then also the ritual of doing that too. Mm -hmm. You know, as your, to your point, like the discipline of sitting down and doing it. A big, I think, gateway for my mental health journey too was, was learning how to journal. And mm -hmm. I remember at the beginning I was – also sounds like a bit of a perfectionist and I was like fuck what am I going to write dear diary like yeah, yeah. you know who's <laughs> going to read this thing like yeah. fuck and it was a really liberating experience for me going oh I don't need it's not about being perfect just let my brain unravel the other thing which I do which makes a difference is say the thing and say because of so I give a reason as okay. to why it is which for me just kind of makes it more it kind of ingrains it even further so what's an example so i would say right now i'm really grateful uh for the relationship I've, i have with my partner it's mm -hmm. like we're just in a pocket where shit's going on but we're just doing it really well together yeah. so i'd say i'm really grateful for loz because she can hold me when i'm feeling a bit sad but also brings me up when i'm ready to be brought up awesome so it's just yeah. like kind of brings it to life yeah um is there anything else you do to, to manage your mental health? I mean, I've just in the past week, again, tried to start a mindfulness practice. I mm. struggle with that. Yeah. 
Um, exercise. Um, uh, seeing a psychologist yeah. really was really helpful in the last few years. Um, who who worked with um, it, something called ACT, Acceptance and Commitment Therapy, which gets you out of the talking brain. And, mm. you know, it's like, what what am I going to do about this? How am I going to get out of this repetitive cycle of thoughts? Um, let the feelings, you know, give, give f- space for my feelings, s- diffuse the thoughts in my head. Those kind of techniques mm. have been really helpful. Diet. Yeah. I mean, I've tried it all, you know, yeah. like when you're, yeah. when you're, yeah, like when your game is so linked to your thought process, you know, when your, your work is so linked expression, you know, yeah. trying to, and, and writing a song for me is not an easy process as well. So, you know, um, psychedelic drugs, you know, things like that have opened my mind in different ways. Um, but, you know, that, that can be abusive as well. Um, so I don't know what I haven't tried, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that's part of it for me is to keep mm. you trying and searching and finding and yeah. just putting your mind in different places. Yeah. Travel, you know. Travel, perspective yeah. shifts and yeah. meeting yourself where you're at because mm-hmm. one thing one day might not be relevant. You're like, yeah. I don't actually feel like gratitude is the best thing for me today. Yeah. I do feel like going for a walk in nature with no technology is. Nice. Yeah, I really like that. And I think the other thing is because of your role, I assume when you're not good, people can feel it. Mm-hmm. You know, when you're yeah. not aligned, it's yeah, like, yeah. what was wrong with him? Like, you know. <laughs> I used to remember when I'd see Prince, he was always on. But I could tell when he was in a bad mood. Mm. I was like, I could tell if he was jet lagged, or yeah, <laughs> and I could tell when he was in a good mood. Yeah, dude, tell me about Prince. Like, yeah. Um. Oh, I just I really connected with Prince when I was finishing school many years ago, and he wasn't. He hadn't done the Grammys or anything. He hadn't like come back into the cycle. He was a bit off cycle. Oh, he's weird. And uh, I um, I get very obsessed with artists, and I like to listen to their whole discography mm. and look at their journey and how they make it. And with Prince, it just didn't stop. It's just <laughs> like this album after album after album and side project. There's like four albums a year. It just doesn't end. Yeah. And I came across an album called the rainbow children and it was his latest album. And it's like a little known jank jazz Jehovah's witness funk odyssey album. And it turned into my favorite album. It's very bizarre, long album, very instrumental based. And, um, I was like, what? He's still doing this now? Yeah. Okay. i got to keep following him. So then I started following him on the forums and collecting bootlegs cool. and, and the fashion, the films. Mm. It just didn't stop. And then I started seeing him live. And um, when he'd come to Australia, I'd see multiple shows and every show would be different. And I, um, he invited me up on stage. Did that just happen? Or It happened on the fourth show that I saw him although there was at the time it was um you could be part of his music club cool and he'd invite you to the sound check so there'd be like 40 people at the sound check Sick. and then if there was an after show you got to go to an after show so sometimes there's three shows in a day it was like hard to keep up and i guess i stood out and on the fourth show the crowd just wasn't vibing in sydney and he picked me out from 15 rows and i was like oh I could like feel like he was looking at me, mm. but I'm like, you don't actually realize until you get on stage, you can see everyone. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, he picked me out on the like fifth song. He's like, what's your name, man? Monty. He's like, you know what to do. Don't you let nobody bring you down. And I oh, just started dancing. So good. Yeah. And then I stayed on stage and his wife was filming me on the little handy cam. And it was fun. And I was like crazy high. And then you fall down mm. like depressed. Like, what yeah. am I doing? I'm a <laughs> prince fan. <laughs> yeah. I um I was tra- a few years later I was traveling to Cuba and with some friends and on the way I went to Las Vegas um ended up on the way back he had his own club there so you'd <laughs> see him play in his club and then he'd play in his restaurant afterwards cool um and he again he brought me up on stage then and then a third time in Australia he brought me up on stage in in Melbourne by that stage. I had released some music and was, was doing some shows and I was like, yeah, I'm not, I'm, this is not my end goal in life to get yeah. on stage with Prince, you know, because <laughs> like when you're that much of a fan and you, it consumes you. Mm. I mean, I would walk around with burnt CDs in my backpack, wow. handing them out to friends and everywhere I would go, people would play Prince. Like, wow. I was like the Prince guy. You're the Prince guy. And people were like talking about like, 
acoustic albums and bootlegs and like, oh yeah, I found this. And we're just, everyone was talking about prints. It was great. <laughs> we were also into like craft work. There's a few other things we were into. Like we'd dress a certain way and like, we yeah, there was a few men's friends making art. It was a cool time. Yeah. But I was like, okay, this is, I've, I've just gone too deep here. Like, I've, I, I've OD'd on prints. Yeah, I need, to, I need to do my own thing. Yeah. And I was like, but do my own thing. Like I like prints. That's, mm. This is ridiculous. I can't do anything near prints. And then when you, 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 you know, when you start making art, you, you start off as a connoisseur of the art. So when you go to make it, you go, I'm so far away from this. I can't do it. I yeah. can't. But I, I don't know. I just, my friend, he had a 16 track and he taught me how to use it a bit. And I started making music with him and I was like, cool. And um, eventually my obsession of prints was still there, but I, I got it more into travel and um, making music myself. Yeah. Have you since reconnected with him given the work? The other performances you guys are doing? Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely, yeah. yeah. Like, I mean, I got to see his last run of shows cool. in Australia, a bunch of them, and it was just him on a piano, and that was merely months before he died. Which yeah. Was, yeah, it was very, very crazy time. Um, yeah, and I, I go through still periodic sessions of connecting with Prince. Yeah. Um, <laughs> he's, he's the greatest of all time. Mm. Yeah. Oh, so good, man. Um, almost like he was the music mentor for you. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah he's the, well, he's the full package. You know? Yeah. You know, like he, he didn't care what, what other people thought and it was art first. Yes. It's not about him as a person. Yeah. So sure, there was a persona and that kind of yeah. helped it all, but it was just the art first. You do, know? do you think he, just coming back to what you said earlier around this like dance of being a character, mm -hmm. but also still being, you know, Monty, mm -hmm. like do you think Prince, did he merge <laughs> into like the one he is now Prince or what do you think his journey was in, because you have to be on, right? And that's like you have to be the performer if you're. He wasn't a performer first though. You don't think? No, no. no. He was very shy. Yeah. He was a musician first. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah, he learned how to perform. Yeah, and yeah. then it was the the art and the creativity that built up into yeah, it. yeah, yeah. Everything you know, he 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 was just the hardest worker. Yeah, he's just the hardest. Like he's the hardest worker. You know, it's yeah, he's a genius, but I would just probably say he's the hardest worker. It's so good to hear that, isn't it? Like, yeah, and from someone who obviously knows him very well, it's like you see the name, the icon, the mm -hmm. symbol. It's just like this epic. It's almost surreal. Yeah. But then to know that that's built in a way. Yeah, I yeah. think I think he um, he struggled to connect with people yeah. as a kid, and he the studio was his safe haven. Yeah, you know, and he got some opportunities to work in a studio by himself, and yeah. he definitely had a gift. But he worked very hard. I mean, the 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 best thing I learned from Prince is to film your shows and watch them afterwards. Yeah, the first time I saw um, our show, we were doing some supports some very early shows and I thought I was shit hot. Everyone yeah. was like, you're amazing. Wow, this is so great. You guys are so different. I was like, yeah, we rock. Someone filmed the show and I saw it and I was like, oh my God, <laughs> that is embarrassing. I'm so bad. My voice is out. My dance moves are out. What am I doing here? This is horrible. And so from there I was like, I've got to improve my game because I'm not proud of that. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, we film our shows and watch them back. That's the best way to learn. You know, you, you, you're the yeah. best critique, so... Yeah, you're always your harshest critic too, yes, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. And you know what needs work. Yeah. Hey, what did you think? You know, right now we're like, we're introducing magic into our set. So there's like flames and lights oh, and stuff. So hey, did you see the flames? They're like, what? <laughs> no, like flames? <laughs> <laughs> they were chatting to their friend at that yeah, moment. Yeah, yeah. They're going to the bar for another drink. Yeah. Oh, come back. Um, I want to come back as well because I think Prince enters into this category too, but also what you said around this element of like transcendence when mm -hmm. you're on stage. Yes. Can you just bring that to life? What do you mean by that? Well, you're in the zone. Yeah. That's for sure. And the zone for you, like, because some people will never have this experience of like, first of all, being on stage, but yes. second of all, yes. owning it as well. Yeah. So, I mean, I remember you were saying you were, you were nervous. You had a big talk. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And nerves are a good thing. That's yeah. the first thing. You yeah. just got to... Nerves are there to help you perform, yeah. to increase your, you know, sensory experience. Mm. Too many nerves, you're just going to be frazzled, um, and too little, which happens to me sometimes, and yeah. you don't care. Yeah. Um, but if you've got that right amount of nerves, and then you feel the silence between you and the audience, there's this kind of magic mm. air between you that 
you feel the vibrations between you. Yeah. When you've got that there, you manage to capture that. Because sometimes you're just performing, you're just doing your thing nervously doing it. <laughs> yeah. And they're watching you and you're settling in. And yeah, hopefully there comes a time where they 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 relax as yeah. well because it's a symbiotic relationship. So yeah. they both relax and then the air between you becomes like special sacred ground that yeah. information is traveled over. And often it's errors mm. that make people relax. Yes. You're all perfect. I do a mic trick and I drop it and yeah. then I laugh and then they're <laughs> like, oh no, but then you keep going. Yeah. Oh, he doesn't care that he made an error. Yeah. Okay, let's go. And then from that point, yeah, the zone is like ripe. Yeah. You know, and everyone gets in the zone all yeah. the time. You know, you do it reading a book yeah people, people think the zone is so special or yeah like, you know so i oh, the song just came to me no you were just in the zone yeah. and your subconscious was working and you were just flowing channeling something you're just flowing like we flow all the time yeah um and some people access it quite easily and yeah some people you know struggle um but yeah it is it is i think it is transcendental like it is um pretty magical i remember the first time we played a festival and i was like this is where i belong this big stage, this big energy. There's more people. Yeah. There's more reason to look and not miss out on something. Yeah. You know. Yeah. You're not gonna miss the flames because <laughs> you know this is everyone's watching. I need to watch. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and feeling being at the center of that's pretty cool. Wow. Yeah. What is that like? It's quite quite humbling, actually. Mm. I think. You know, you think it makes you go, "I'm amazing," but you realize I could fuck up so easily. Yeah. You know, I could slip in so many ways. So much could go wrong. And so in embracing that potential of something going wrong is like kind of good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it comes back to what you said around that. Like if you do stuff up, my experience with not nowhere near yours, but is being on stage as the audience reacts to how you react. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. If I panic, mm. they panic. Yeah. But if I laugh, oh, he's a human. Yes. <laughs> yeah, you know? yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, fir- the, the my first experience with that was year six Canberra camp. Our school went to Canberra. We had we had a fire on the hill one night and it was like, you know, oh, we get to stay up late tonight. We had a fire and they had stories and maybe songs. And then we had to walk down the hill from the fire and it was in pitch blackness through a forest. And I just started singing, Heidi, 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 ho. And then the whole, whole school started following me and I started giving all these variations. And the power just grew mm. and grew and grew. And I was like, this is incredible. Yeah. This is like, and especially because it was silent, you know, and that's mm. why music is magical. I, yeah. I say people see with their eyes, but eventually you just let go and you mm. listen. No one could see. They could just hear. Wow. And, you know, you're leading with your voice. It's cool. Uh, yeah. It just reminds me is that the queen set for the, like the, the I'm going to say this wrong, but the, I think it was around the Live Aid or something yes, like yeah, that. Wembley, yeah. 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 Oh, so Gosh, Freddy, God. Yeah. Freddie Mercury. It's just, unbelievable yeah. witnessing that yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and like just that whole narrative of where he'd come from the band the challenges but then that iconic performance yes well yeah. although that film the film the, they just stuffed with the narrative to make yeah. it more dramatic hollywood. Yeah. yeah which i don't know that film that doesn't sound like hollywood at oh, all. <laughs> that, yeah that film has its problems that's for sure yeah, yeah. Hey. especially as a musician because you see like the roadies sitting on the amp going yeah this is awesome it's like no nah. that does not happen no it was like so just too clean <laughs> too clean yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, um i reckon there's a few movies that represent things a little bit like that yeah. um man i want to talk about like the, the obviously the travel comes into it like these big experiences you give so much energy outwardly you've also got to take care of yourself how do you navigate your family life alongside this like kind of pretty big responsibilities that are in mm. front of you not always successfully i guess because mm. it's like you you're tired and irritable and not there and not helping uh, it's been nice during covid to stay home um it's also been nice saying no to things you know we have a bit of that luxury now that's like nah we're not going to europe you know mm. like we're not gonna stay home we're gonna do those gigs they're nice they'll pay us you know um, we're not going to like push ourselves, push ourselves, push ourselves. But I don't know what advice I have for that. Like, yeah, helping. Yeah. I mean, I'm just very fortunate. My family's very loving and mm. uh, my wife is incredible. 
but yeah, I don't, I don't, that's my art has no, I don't, you know, represent my family and my art. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, there's always a distinction there. So yeah. I think it would be a lot harder if, yeah, it was, pu- it was part of the persona. You know, I, I don't, I don't really um, create content on social media unless I, unless it's necessary. It's yeah. advertising and I get it, I'll do it. Or um, it's, unless it's art itself, it's an opportunity to create art, yeah. you know? And I think, yeah, I couldn't, I can't daily vlog. I couldn't do <laughs> yeah. that, you know? <laughs> no, I think it's, 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 all, it's just finding a sweet spot, right? Mm. Isn't it? It's like, you know, if you've got limited, I always think about, you've got limited fucks to give, where do you want to give your fucks? Yeah, you know? <laughs> like like that. It's like, yeah. you know, for you, if you want to channel that energy into the performance or the creative process for the new ideas around magic or whatever, like fucking do that. Yeah, yeah. I think that's important. It's very easy to get led astray and com- comparing yourself, especially on social media and that kind of thing. Oh, oh I need to be DJing at that festival. Or you know, it's like, what? Totally. Yeah, I want to do magic to, <laughs> to how many people were in, there was 450 people in Gosford last Saturday. I did some magic. That was cool. You know? <laughs> and probably only a hundred of them actually saw the magic. <laughs> the magic. <laughs> but they had a good time. Yeah, they had a good time and I did as well. And I want that magic to be even better next time, you know? Yeah. yeah. Oh, so good. Did you actually have to learn magic? Yeah, we, um, we commissioned a um, incredible magician, Melbourne magician called Richard Vegas. Cool. Yeah. Great name. Yes. Yeah, he's, he's <laughs> awesome. Yeah. He Mate. knows his shit. Yeah. It's 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 talking about craft, like isn't mm. it just wild? I yeah. never thought I'd get into magic. I yeah. always thought it was pretty naff. <laughs> yeah. But then I saw it with you know like Michael Jackson. Yeah, you know, in incorporating incorporating it into the show, like mm. how do you make the show better? Of course, would lead ourselves to magic. <laughs> yeah, in some ways, the yeah. inevitable <laughs> end know. point, isn't it? What's next? Yeah. But it's like, yeah, that's the mysticism, right, of like mm. magic is this, um, even the transcendental thing you're saying about energetics and like the sacred space. It's like, yeah, magic pulls us out of this human experience and puts us into this like liminal space where we're like, oh, I, I, I've got nothing to grab onto, yeah, you know, that's it, my yeah. reality. Defy and then like, expectations. That's, that's it. it, yeah. And then also like a, a great performers, uh, phenomenal diffusers of tension. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you bring up the high and then you cut it yes. down. And, yeah. and I think that's what, what magic does so well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So you've got some shows coming up in May. Yeah. Um, so what are we to expect? That's a, it's a good question with the music industry <laughs> we right don't now know. <laughs> because it's like, you know, oh, we expect festivals. Oh, no, they're cancelled. Oh, we mm. expect, you know, a tour. You know, we've had so many things cancel. Yeah. So we're just like, okay, this is coming up really soon for small club shows on yeah. the East Coast um, and, you know, packed venues, magic. We're going to do some covers. We've got lots of new material. We've got lots of old material. Like it's when we play a festival, it's hard to squeeze the songs yeah. in. We have to cut them into medleys and, you know, squeeze them into a 60 minute set. But doing our own show in a venue is really fun. We can stretch out and yeah. Very cool. And then I think I saw you guys are looking to create a club. Did I read that correctly? Yeah. Well, yeah, we, yeah we've, we've got a song called Club Called Heaven. Yeah. And um, yeah, so it's like we're creating our own club called Heaven, which the song is about um, a nightclub in London. Yeah. in Charing Cross called Heaven Night Club and we played there. Cool. Um, and that was a really magical show. Um, so, yeah, like recreating that vibe here. Very yeah. cool. Where yeah. Do you have any more details of where that Yeah, will- so we've got um, in Melbourne, it's a, uh, 170 Russell and um, Sydney we're playing at the Metro Theatre, playing in Hobart and we're playing in Brisbane as well. Yeah, it's all available online, yeah. Check very, it out. Yeah. Very, check it out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Very cool, mate. Um, and just, yeah, I just want to kind of round out your relationship with Harvey. Like mm. what a journey you guys have been on yeah. together. Like I'm sure huge highs, huge, huge lows. But what's, what's it been like to co-journey with someone through this? Yeah, well, it's like a marriage of sorts. <laughs> yeah. you know? um, I, I think what's helped is that um, his, his brother, Geordie, is my old friend. Mm. So we're family and... Um, it is probably yeah closer to family than, um, yeah than a marriage. Um, yeah, I mean it's I, I don't think we would have. I think it's just serendipitous that you know his beat and my vocal came together and that's what worked and we're still working on that and so that's like life. You just gotta 
keep following the thing that works and it it works between us it's not like it's not always um you know happy days but it's also lots of fun we've had a lot of fun along the way we're, we're quite different yeah. in the way our brains work yeah i like kind of like multitasking and he likes focusing on one thing yeah so there's all conflict arises from that but through the madness and it's yeah, often yeah. quite mad yeah. quite liaison's world is <laughs> yeah quite mad <laughs> we end up creating things so yeah i think that's where the friction often whilst it sucks at the time is where the breakthrough is yeah mm. there's this even yeah. like being an entrepreneur and running a couple of businesses now like there's a saying that on the edge of agitation is incredible breakthrough mm. and i think you know if there's a level of psychological safety amongst the team or the partnership then you can challenge each other get pissed off each other but you know you'll come back to repairing it mm-hmm. and then the end game which you're trying to re- produce the result of is the best product sure yeah, yeah that's yeah. what counts that's yeah. what counts yeah. yeah um mate and just kind of final questions as you we we do a lot of work th- with young men mm-hmm. is there anything that you reflect back on your journey as a young man navigating all the things that you, you had to move through that you, you wish you knew that you know now um and again it doesn't have to be polished or perfect mm. just like what did i wish i or, knew or even had some i mean i i yeah i i just can't really I can't, it's hard to speak for the past. Mm. There's so much chatter in my mind that I wouldn't know. I can't decipher what's past and what's present. So like I could say, oh, I wish I had a gratitude practice. Yeah. But I probably didn't need that then. Yeah. You know, like I was pretty invincible when I was young. I thought I was. Yeah. I'm not sure what I could tell my younger self. Yeah. Yeah. I think it. what I hear in that is it's like it'll play it out how it played out. Yeah. yeah yeah i'm incredibly lucky I, I, yeah um yeah so i i have had an amazing life so yeah amazing man yeah and what a thing to be grateful for yeah um i mean and in the end it's not that for me what i create is not about me mm. you know i don't usually talk about me yeah i feel a little bit uncomfortable <laughs> Thanks, <dude. laughs> like in a public setting it's yeah. quite it's quite uncomfortable i prefer to just talk about the art yeah but um, yeah, it's not about me. It's about the work, and then uh, and that's what I see in Prince. It's not yeah. about him. It's about his work. Mm. Yeah, and and he he is the persona of that work. Of that work. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I just want to say thank you. You know, thanks like, for having. Me. Yeah, thanks for having me, Hunter. It's yeah. um, you know, amazing to see kind of the the depth and breadth of of you. You oh, know, thank you. Because I, I, you can see to your point, like these unbelievable experiences where you're blowing people's minds, making them feel feels they've never felt. Um, but then also just to kind of step in here and just be so open and authentic is, is really special. So I just want to say thank you oh, for that. Thank you. If there's anything I can do to help with um, your cause or helping, I love working with kids. So awesome, man. Yeah. Thanks.